All right, well, you know what? Today we are continuing along in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, you may recall, wrapped up with dealing with the true authority of Jesus. And we saw in Mark chapter 11, verses 27 28, he said, They came again to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came and asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus saw their trap. He saw that they were not genuinely seeking the truth. And he caught them in their foolishness by answering them, answering their question with a question. And in that moment, he established very clearly that he really was the true authority and that the priests, those scribes, uh, the elders, they all were refusing to really admit the truth. So Jesus, he then makes that accuse, I'm sorry, he makes that accusation against them very, very vividly clear, and he foreshadows even a little bit of what is ahead for him, and it is amazing what happens next. But before we get into it, let's pray again together. Lord, thank you for your word. I thank you for all that you went through so that we could have life, that we could laugh, that we could know joy, that we could know forgiveness and peace as we prayed earlier today. God, I thank you that you are the ultimate hero. You stepped into history and you made everything different because you came to rescue us. God, help us to encounter you this morning. I pray your word would speak to us. We know it is only going to get through to us, Lord. As our hearts are softened, as we are open to hear what you have for us. So Jesus, I pray that you would do that very thing in our lives right now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's examine this passage of Scripture now. And by this passage of Scripture, I mean moving now to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 1. All right, that's a good place to start, right? Mark chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, He began to speak to them in parables. Now, I know this is becoming a bit of a running joke in these messages. <laughs> well, we have to stop here, okay? Just for a few minutes here. He began to speak to them in parables. Now, early on in the Gospel of Mark, we saw Jesus do this very thing as well, right? Back in Mark chapter 4, uh, we're going to jump back in time here a little bit. Go to Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And this is the first in the Gospel of Mark uh, parable, really, that's described for us in the Gospel of Mark anyway. Uh, and that is the parable of the sower. Uh, it's called the parable of the souls. Uh, souls. Parable of the sower and of the soils, uh, and it's a both and on that. But anyway, again, he began to teach by the sea. You picture the scene now, right? Beautiful day. This is what I imagine anyway. He began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat on the sea and sat down while the whole crowd was by the sea on the shore. Just imagine that beautiful picture and Jesus getting ready to teach. And verse 2 tells us, He taught them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, consider the sower who went out to sow. Now, a parable, of course, has been described uh, by some as it, a, you know, an earthly story, has some kind of heavenly meaning, but it's really a lot more than that. The word parable comes from this idea of setting alongside something, and as Jesus used parables, the idea was to set a spiritual truth alongside some daily truth of living, just something from everyday life. So you take a very spiritual thing, powerful thing, he'd lay it beside something that you would recognize and know, and he would make a point from the story, sometimes multiple points. Uh, but anyway, a parable is a story that begins, or rather brings that spiritual truth alongside that ordinary thing. Now it's not an allegory, so every little thing in a parable doesn't necessarily mean something, right? It's not like well, uh, you know, a sower went out to sea, I mean, went out to soil. Well, there's something in that dirt, there's something in the sky, there's something in the water. There's not something in everything in a parable, uh, but there are some things to be drawn. But it's not an analogy, or rather an allegory uh, that he's talking about. Generally, there's one basic idea or a couple of ideas that are being communicated. So he says in that story, in that parable, a sower went out to sow. And in this very early parable, Jesus describes something that they were all pretty much familiar with there in, uh, in 
in Jerusalem. A farmer casting seed on the ground and the seed falling on different types of soil. And then down in uh, verses 10 through 12 of chapter 4, he explains why he uses parables, all right? So we're just jumping back in time here for a minute. Jesus explaining ahead of time why he was using parables. And in chapter 4 of Mark, verses 10 through 12, it says, When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he answered them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those outside, everything comes in parables, so that they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn and turn back and be forgiven. Now, Jesus is quoting a passage from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 here. And uh, that is a, a passage where the prophet Isaiah is being called to preach and prophesy to a very hard-hearted generation. So it's interesting that he is saying this, that I am speaking in parables to people who have hard hearts, right? But also to those who are also listening. In a parallel passage, uh, in this early parable in the Gospel of Matthew, this same story, this same parable, Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, it says, Then the disciples came up and asked him, Why are you speaking to them in parables? And he answered, Because the secrets of the kingdom have been given for you to know. All right, so we just read that in the Gospel, Mark 2. But it has not been given to them. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That is why I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, you will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. Now, verse 15 of this passage in Matthew uh, really clarifies something for us here this morning. He says, for this people's heart has grown callous, their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. So everybody stay awake. Don't shut your eyes. <laughs> okay, just playing off earlier. Okay, otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn back and I would heal them. And then verse 16 says, Blessed are your eyes because they do see, and your ears because they do hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see the things you see, but didn't see them. To hear the things you hear, but didn't hear them. So we're seeing in this bit about the parable of the sower that happened earlier on, and as is described even more fully in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, that it's not really the parable itself that keeps people from understanding what Jesus is teaching, but rather it is their hardened hearts that are keeping them from understanding the truth of the parable. But Jesus is often using the parable when he's speaking to a crowd as an invitation for us to know him deeply or to know him better for those who are in the crowd to know him. In verse 3 of chapter 4, as he begins his parable, he says to the crowd, listen, right? He's calling them to listen. Listen up, attend to, you know, attend your ears to what I'm about to say. He wants them to hear. He wants them to know. So uh, he says to the crowd, listen, consider the sower who went out to sow. And then after he told that parable down in verse 9, he says, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. So what's happening in the parable is that the parable is creating a hunger to know more. So depending on who you are listening to that parable, you hear the parable and, uh, and you, you may treat it one way uh, as you're hearing. But if you're really interested and you're seeking truth, it creates something you want to know more about that. Now, uh, you'll ask for more understanding. And notice what it says in verse 10 of chapter 4. I know you're saying, well, I thought we were in chapter 12. I know, hang on, we're almost there. Mark chapter 4, verse 10, he says, When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. It says, those around him with the twelve. Who were the twelve? His twelve disciples. So it wasn't just the twelve he was talking to. He was also talking to those who gathered around him after he told the parable who wanted to know more. He had created a thirst. And if you were just, you know, sitting there, think about it. He tells a story about a sower sowing seed or someone who's going to plant some seed. And he doesn't tell them at that point what the seed represents. That parable has a key, a key to understanding it. It's only there for those who truly are seeking uh, to understand it. 
The idea is you will not understand if you're not genuinely seeking and listening. So when Jesus tells a parable of the sower and the soils, there might have been a farmer or two out there. But oh, yeah, yeah, I did that yesterday, right? And he's hearing Jesus tell this parable. And he might think, oh, you know, he's right. Maybe I should be careful about where I throw my seed and, you know, not throw it on rock and not throw it on whatever. And maybe they'll just get some, you know, farming advice, <laughs> right? Because, you know, they're not really seeking any truth. Or maybe they just want to, uh, you know, tear apart what he's saying. And they're trying to get at Jesus, but he's talking in things they're not quite getting and there may be attacking all the things that weren't even the point of the parable because they weren't seeking truth. Now, someone who is honestly seeking the truth will be intrigued that one or more they have ears to hear. Now, you may have the wrong heart and mindset this morning. You're grumpy, you're tired, you're not really wanting to hear it. Maybe you've heard it before. Or, or maybe you're just not seeking truth. Maybe you're online here today, you're just passing through. And you really, you know, you're not really sure, right? You have a skeptical eye as you're hearing this stuff. We're talking about Jesus, and, and you're not even really sure. And your heart might not be receptive to it. So let me just challenge you to open your ears, open your heart to hear what the Scripture is saying so that you don't miss what the Scripture is telling us. Uh, if you don't have the right heart, you don't have the right mindset, you will miss and you will not understand what Jesus talks about in his parable. So, parables. Right. So, in Mark 12, <laughs> Mark 12, verse 1, Jesus begins to speak to them in parables. In parables. There's no Z, but there is an S, right? Uh, just one last little thing about this parable thing, and at least in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark says he began to speak to them in parables. But then he only tells us one. <laughs> what's going on here he doesn't say parable he says parables now here's the thing there were three of these kind of big parables of accusation that Jesus actually tells in the timeline of history when this is happening okay and uh, one is of the two sons uh, it's combined with uh, this story and then there's one about the marriage of the king's son and in the gospel of Matthew he has all three of those parables that you can read in the Gospel of Matthew when he's talking about this very encounter and this very story. But Mark shares only one because it's typical of the Gospel of Mark, right? Everything's moving fast. He's not throwing in a whole ton of details. He has a very clear purpose in what he's doing and how he's telling uh, what he saw, what he heard, what he understood about Jesus in this moment, right? So he doesn't give us all those details. So Matthew has all three of them. Mark only shares one. But Mark does tell us and gives us an indication that he knows there were more than one, right? Because he says parables, and then he focuses on the main one. And that's what's happening there. So I just want you to know that if anybody ever challenges you and says, Mark doesn't know anything. My, Matthew and Mark, they're completely different. No, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> All right, so he's aware of the three because he says parables. And then in verse 1, it continues. The parable of the vineyard owner is what this is usually called. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug out a pit for a wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and went away. Now you may have a translation you're looking at that might say vine dressers there, but they're tenant farmers who went away. Verse 2 says, At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from them. Now, Jesus is describing this process, right, of, of keeping a vineyard. And he's describing it perfectly in that ancient time, in that uh, early, well, yeah, in that part of the world, and also that time in history. This is a great description of what it was like and what it looked like to have a vineyard. All right, so this process of keeping a vineyard, he's describing perfectly. Uh, it, it, it's very, you know, the wine from the grapes was very much like olive oil. It was a precious crop for Israel that needed to be tended perfectly. And sometimes the owner of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a vineyard would lease out people to tend to it. They would often live in that little watchtower. They would dig things out. They would do all these things that Jesus is describing uh, as a part of the uh, vineyards of the day. All the details, the planting, the fence, the hedge around it, the pit for the wine press, the watchtower, all of those kinds of things were very common. And so as Jesus is describing this, people would have immediately, as with most parables, understood exactly the description he's painting for them. Uh, this arrangement of hiring farmers to tend the owner's land, 
uh, and to tend their vineyard. That was also a very common situation. There were actually sometimes d disputes from when someone who owned a place and they were gone and they were gone for too long, then there would a dispute might come up between those who were tending it saying, well, he's been gone three years. You know, this is, this is ours now, right? <laughs> he doesn't even own it. He's not even here anymore. Uh, so anyway, again, uh, everyone hearing this parable would have immediately recognized all of that because Jesus also was speaking generally in this moment to a Jewish audience there were many in the crowd who were also aware that the vineyard, the idea and the picture of a vineyard was used often in the Old Testament as a picture of Israel. It was a description often when we talk about the vineyard. It was a reflection of God's people, the nation of Israel. But another thing that they would know and understand uh, was that whole imagery of that vineyard. And it had become recognized, as I said, as almost a symbol of Israel itself, uh, those covenant people of God. Psalms 80, verse 8 says, You dug up a vine from Egypt, and you drove out the nations and planted it, in a reference to the nation of Israel. Jeremiah 2, verse 21, I planted you a choice vine from the very best seed. How could you turn into a degenerate foreign vine? Here's this accusation in the uh, prophet, from the prophet Jeremiah to the nation of Israel, referring to them as a choice vine, a choice vineyard. But the immediate passage that would have immediately been glaringly obvious when Jesus began to paint this picture of a vineyard, right? It immediately came to their mind. It had to be. This passage of Scripture from Isaiah, chapter 5, and verses 1 through 7. Now listen to these words from the Old Testament, describing the nation of Israel. I will sing about the one I love, a song about my beloved one's vineyard. The one I love had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. He expected it to yield good grapes, but it yielded worthless grapes. So now, residents of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I did? Why, when I expected a yield of good grapes, did it yield worthless grapes? Now I will tell you what I'm about to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will tear down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or weeded. Thorns and briars will grow up. I will also give orders to the clouds that rain should not fall on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, the plant he delighted in, he expected justice, but saw injustice. He expected righteousness, but heard cries of despair. Now put it in context for a moment. Remember, Jesus has entered Jerusalem. He went, he cursed a fig tree. It wasn't bearing fruit. We saw the parallel as he goes into the temple and he realizes it's not being handled as it's supposed to be handled. It's not bearing fruit either. It is very much like this vineyard being described as he's talking about the nation of Israel. Now with that Old Testament passage in mind, Look at how this part of the parable that Jesus is telling plays out. Mark chapter 12, verse 3. But they took him. This is the servant that was sent, okay? They took him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another servant to them, and they hit him on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. He also sent many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He still had one to send, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill the farmers and give the vineyard 
to others. Wow. In this story Jesus is telling, remember, he's still talking to those religious leaders who are still right there as well. All right? He's going right into this after they just challenged his authority and he answered the question with a question, right? Was it John's baptism from heaven or was it not, right? He really challenged them and they had no question. Well, we don't know, right? That's, that was their response to him. And he's still talking to them and he's telling this very vivid story. And the owner of the vineyard in his story in this parable is extraordinarily patient. He sends messenger after messenger to them and the vine dressers or the tenant farmers, they mistreated and they abused all of them. Now, the owner of the vineyard wasn't there. They didn't see him. They didn't see him from day to day. So they doubted and, and even made a mockery of the authority of this so-called owner of the vineyard. Pastor and commentator David Guzik says they soon found out that even though they couldn't see the owner, his authority was still very real. There is the idea here of the many prophets that God had sent to the nation of Israel and how Israel had rejected many of them along the way and didn't listen to them and in some cases treated them horribly. But most pointedly, Jesus is now telling them something that is even more striking, right? They, I'm sure they picked up on all that. They were catching the story. They were understanding the vineyard. I mean, nobody could miss it, whether they had ears to hear or not. They, they couldn't miss that because they knew exactly what he was talking about. And when he begins to describe this uh, situation, there became to be a, a bit of a suspicion, perhaps, on the part of the religious leaders. But the most pointed thing about this is Jesus is telling him that he himself, in his parable, is the son of this story. And that these religious leaders who had been given the responsibility of the spiritual care and the leadership of God's people over all of this time, those guys are the vine dressers. They are the tenant farmers. And it's very, very clear how he's saying it. But Jesus is saying, I'm the son who has been sent. I am that son in this story. And I know what you're going to do to me. But look way back. First verse, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, we see, told to us clearly by Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who? The Son of God. And in Mark chapter 1, a little farther down, verses 9 through 11, it said, In those days Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee, uh, uh, sorry, came from Nazareth and Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And as soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. Then Jesus drives this point home in verse 10. Mark chapter 12, verse 10. Haven't you read this scripture? Now this, is, now, this is cold, by the way. This is, this is very cold on Jesus' part. He is talking to scribes. He's talking to religious leaders. He's talking to people who knew the Scripture. They could quote it to you. But he says to them, Have you, Haven't you read the Scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Jesus is quoting from the famous Messianic Song of Ascent, Psalm chapter 118, right? In verse 22 of uh, Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord and it is wondrous in our sight. Then I love that the next verse that we never really often see in context, but here it is. After all that, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord and it is wondrous in our sight. Verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. So this psalm, Psalm 118, is quoted or referred to often in the New Testament. Not just by Jesus here. It's often referred to, like I said, as the Messianic Psalm. It's a picture of the Messiah's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Uh, as I said, also, it's one of those psalms of ascent that people who were pilgrims on their way into the uh, festivals in Jerusalem would often sing these psalms as they made their way upwards <coughs> towards Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, it's actually the last psalm of ascent in that regard. Peter quoted it when he was talking to the religious leaders in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, and he quoted it again in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. The Apostle Paul references it in the book of Romans 9.33 and also in Ephesians he alludes to it. And in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 9 as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, some of you guys already remember this. 
I'd be shocked if you did it. It was back in uh, September. We talked about Jesus coming in to Jerusalem to the sounds of Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then we talked about, and I even said, you know what, a little farther down, there's sort of a parallel quote from this psalm. It's the same psalm. Jesus entered into Jerusalem uh, to that, that uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, a throwback to Psalm 118, and here he is now quoting it in, the, in a fuller context saying, yeah, Hosanna then, but now it's different, isn't it? Because he's also described as the stone who makes people stumble. And he's described as the rock that makes them fall. What you believe about Jesus is the most important question to resolve in all of life. And I exaggerate not even a little. It's the most important thing that you will ever determine in your heart. What you believe about Jesus will change everything. Is he who he claims to be or is he not? There was a mid-19th century uh, Christian <coughs> preacher who was Scottish. I know this is St. Patrick's Day, but <laughs> he was Scottish. He was nicknamed Rabbi because of how, uh, well, I won't get into all that, but anyway, his name was John Duncan. Uh, and he discussed what he called a trilemma. <laughs> Not a dilemma, but a trilemma, right? And basically he wrote this, Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud, or he was himself deluded and self-deceived, or he was divine. There's no getting out of this trilemma, and it's, a, it's inexorable. Well, that's a hard word to say, Leona. <laughs> Inexorable. In 1936, Watchman Nee made a similar argument in his book, Normal Christian Faith. Uh, and then uh, it was really C.S. Lewis uh, who uh, probably most eloquently described this basic idea uh, years later, of course. And this is what he said in his book, Mere Christianity. Some of you have heard this clearly, but let me read to you what uh, C.S. Lewis said. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, talking about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, <laughs> or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option, or has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. From Mere Christianity, great words from C.S. Lewis. My question to you this morning is simply this. Will you... Reject him as Lord or receive him today. Since today is St. Patrick's Day in the United States, I feel I should at least mention a little something about the guy named Patrick who's being referred to in the, in the holiday. Patrick was a very complicated and complex person in history. He has a fascinating story. If you begin to search it and really research it, you understand how much is myth and how much uh, is actually true. But I want to mention him here, uh, or what I want to mention to him about him here, is what I'm trying to say, is that he was a 5th century missionary who brought Christianity to the shores of Ireland. And throughout all of his writing, Patrick goes out of his way to attribute any of his success in his mission in Ireland to God's grace in his life. And this is what he wrote. For that reason, I give thanks to the one who strengthened me in all things so that he would not impede me in the course I had undertaken, and from the works also which I had learned from Christ my Lord. Rather I sensed in myself no little strength from him, and my faith passed the test before God and people. Who was Jesus to Patrick of St. Patrick's Day? He was Christ the Lord. Now Jesus asked his disciples this very, very important question. 
In Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 29, Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea and Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And in Matthew's account, we see Peter's even fuller response in Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Listen, understanding who Jesus is, is more important than understanding who you are. Because it's not until you really understand who He is will you ever truly begin to understand who you are. My prayer for you this morning is not that you respond as the religious leaders did, as we discover in verse 12. They were looking for a way to arrest Him, but feared the crowd because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. Look at this phrase. Let it shake you to your core to consider. So they left him and went away. So Jesus tells them this powerful parable. And this time the parable is not only thinly veiled, it's only thinly veiled because even the ones who were not honestly seeking the hurt, at least uh, seeking the truth, at least heard the parable and the basic meaning of the parable. They knew it was about them. But as before, their hearts were hardened. And instead of responding in repentance to the truth they were encountering, they responded with rebellion. And they were offended by that truth. But Jesus, see, he is the stone that the builders rejected. But he was revealing in that moment that he was the cornerstone, the one that holds it all together. So again, how will you respond to him today? Has his parable created a thirst in you to know him more, to know more about him? Or will you also leave and go away? Just leave him and go away. Or will you fall before him this morning and believe on him as Lord? Well... I know that many of you in the room have done that before you've started that journey. I hope these words encourage and inspire you. But perhaps those of you, there may be someone here, there may be someone online who has never done that. And this is a crisis and critical moment for you today. So let's bow our heads together. Let's pray. And let me give you a chance to respond to him. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the invitation is clear in Romans 10.13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Was well, that you today? Have you never fully trusted in Him. Maybe today, something uh, from the words of Scripture today have, uh, have sparked your heart, and you realize, you know, He is who He said He is. And you're ready to believe on Him right now. Well, you can pray with me from wherever you are in whatever time you're even hearing this. You can pray with me right now. Jesus, today, I realize and confess I am a sinner who needs You. I'm believing on You right now as Lord, the Lord, God who came to save me. There's much I don't understand here, but I do believe you died on a cross in my place. You took my sin upon you. Then you rose from the dead, making it possible for me to have some forgiveness and to have a truly a new life. So Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of my sin. Change me right now. Lord, make me new. God, give my heart to you and my life to you right now. I want to follow you from this day forward with all that I am. Lord, help me to do that. And I'm trusting you to save me right now. Christ followers, maybe you can pray this with me. Lord, thank you for all that you have done for me. Thank you for coming into this world, forgiving me, dying on a cross, and then raising from the, uh, raising from the dead uh, so that I could have life. God, you made it possible so I could be a new person. So help me this week to become more and more like you in everything I think, and in my attitudes, my actions, and everything I do. I pray it in Jesus' name.